Um, so great to see our full room with uh, lots of faces and good conversation. So we hope to continue that through the event. And also, please feel free to stay after for another glass of wine or, or some snacks. Um, I'm Mariam Hamadani. I'm the Associate Director of CCSRE, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's event. We're here to celebrate the work of Estelle Friedman. She's our, one of our faculty fellows this year, and also to enjoy you know, a time to kind of take out a few minutes to sit back, talk, um, have some food, relax. We mean these events to be informal, but also a great chance to come and share and celebrate the work of our own faculty here at Stanford. So feel free. No, to get up and get another glass of wine and say hi to your neighbor. And as we uh, go through the conversation, um, you know, this is, this is meant to be participatory. So we look forward to hearing your views during the discussion part of the event. I'd also like to thank the Clayman Institute. Uh, they're our co-sponsor for the event. So thank you uh, for them for their generous support. And then before I turn it over to Catherine Jin Lum, she is going to be our moderator for today's event. I'd like to acknowledge our other fellows for this year. The first is Catherine herself, uh, so we have our fellows actually moderating each other's Chautauquas this year. Um, and her Chautauqua is going to take place on February 12th uh, in this room, so we hope you can come back and join us. And her book is called Damnation, Hell in America from Revolution to Reconstruction. We have great titles, Redefining Rape, Hell in America, so you got you to gotta come back for, for the next one. And then on April 30th, we'll have Lauren Davenport. She's Assistant Professor of Political Science. And she'll be talking actually about a new book manuscript that's about to go out for publication. And it's called Beyond Black and White, Multiracial Attitudes in Contemporary US Politics. I also hope you had the chance to attend our October event, which was co-sponsored with African and African American Studies. Uh, hi to Cheryl and Sammy <laughs> in here. Um, that was uh, celebrating um, Alison Hobbs' work. She's also a professor of history, and her book is called The Chosen Exile, A History of Racial Passing in American Life. So now let me turn it over to our moderator uh, for today's event. This is uh, Professor Catherine Jin Lum, and she's an assistant professor of religious studies, CSRE, and also by courtesy of history. Her teaching and research focuses on the lived ramifications of religious beliefs and on the intersections between race and religion in America. And her first, first book, which you gotta come back in and talk with us about, asks how widespread belief, uh, excuse me, widespread belief in hell influenced Americans' perceptions of themselves and of the rest of the world in the first century of U.S. nationhood. She's also co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Race in American History and is developing a second project about religion, race, and technology in the 19th century. So please join me in welcoming Catherine Jin Lum. Thank you, Mario. So I am deeply honored to introduce Estelle Friedman, Edgar E. Robinson Professor in U.S. History and her stunning and important new book, Redefining Rape, Sexual Violence in the Era of Suffrage and Segregation, published in 2013 by Harvard University Press. Professor Friedman hardly needs introduction. Uh, diminutive stature aside, and I can say that since I'm even shorter, <laughs> Estelle is a towering figure in women's history and feminist studies. She received her PhD and MA in history from Columbia and her BA in history from Barnard. Stanford has been lucky to have her here since 1976. She co-founded the program in feminist, gender, and sexuality studies here and has received many teaching awards at both the undergraduate and the graduate levels. Professor Friedman has also been awarded numerous national research fellowships and prizes. Redefining Rape is just the latest in a series of seminal books, including My Desire for History, Essays on Gay, Community, and Labor History, which won the John Boswell Prize from the Committee on LGBT History at the American Historical Association in 2013, The Essential Feminist Reader, Feminism, Sexuality, and Politics, No Turning Back, The History of Feminism and the Future of Women, which was a Choice Magazine and Library Journal Editor's selection for Best Academic Books of 2002, Maternal Justice, Miriam Van Waters and the Female Reform Tradition, which won the Sierra Prize from the Western Association of Women Historians in 1996, Intimate Matters, A History of Sexuality in America with John D'Amelio, which was a notable book of 1988 in the New York Times Book Review, and Their Sisters Keepers, Women's Prison Reform in America, which won the Hamilton Publication Prize in 1979. Redefining Rape has also been sweeping the prizes, winning the Darlene Clark Hine Award from the Organization of American Historians in 2014, 
the Emily Toth Award from the Popular Culture Association and American Culture Association in 2014, and the Francis Richardson Keller Sierra Prize from the Western Association of Women Historians in 2014. It's been covered in The Guardian, The Daily Beast, The London School of Economics Review of Books, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Salon.com, and the SF Chronicle, among other outlets. It isn't hard to see why the book has met with such acclaim. One might say it's timely, pointing to recent headlines like Lincoln University President Robert Jennings' statement about how women allege rape when sex, quote, did not turn out the way they wanted it to turn out, to the spate of recent accusations against Bill Cosby. And obviously the issue is incredibly pressing on college campuses. Uh, just yesterday I read the story in Rolling Stone about rape culture at UVA. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but it's just horrifying. But of course what's so powerful about redefining rape is that it isn't just relevant because of recent news, but because it makes a bold claim about the centrality of rape to the very definition and redefinition of citizenship in the United States. Defining who could and who could not consent to sex had crucial implications in a nation that was supposedly based on consent, the consent of the governed. So Professor Friedman shows how historically white men defined rape narrowly in order to shore up their own political power, offering up a stereotype of a chaste white woman victimized by an aggressive male stranger, usually defined as black. By redefining rape beyond this stereotype, expanding who could count as victim and aggressor, what kinds of situations constituted rape, and who could benefit from legal protection, women and African Americans challenged the power of white men to control their bodies and the nation. Redefining rape is remarkable in its use of a wide range of sources, from legal documents to newspaper articles and images, and in the intimate and often heartbreaking stories that it offers amidst a sweeping history that takes us from the colonial era to the present. I mean, it's even more than the subtitle claims. So, and what I really appreciated too about the book is its sensitivity, not only to the gains, but also to the costs and the compromises of redefining rape. So on page 254, uh, Professor Friedman describes, and these are her words, a central dilemma within the modern politics of rape. How to extend the legal protections enjoyed by white male citizens to African American men without undermining women's rights to legal protection. Throughout the book, Estelle masterfully illustrates this dilemma, showing the deep intertwining of race, class, and gender in the politics of rape, and how progress in one arena could lead to setbacks in another. Acknowledging that some white women made false accusations did help break down assumptions about black men as sexual threats, she writes on page 273. But at the same time, it contributed to a larger cultural trend toward dismissing women's charges against either black or white men. Professor Friedman also shows how when rape and race were disentangling, class played an important role, in her words, as the measure of which women could refuse to consent to sex. So it's a very complicated story, but it's one that's told so very clearly and so very carefully. It does not shy away from politics, and yet it isn't polemical. It's provoked a number of questions for me. I'm very interested in how the various different groups jockeying for power both could and could not form alliances, and in how deeply entangled their interests could be. I'd love to hear more about women who did not want to redefine rape, and also about the relationship between interracial rape stereotypes and intraracial rape allegations. And I'm sure that the audience has loads of questions too, so I think we'll probably have a lively discussion later on. Uh, but first, let's hear from the author herself. So please join me in welcoming Professor Estelle Friedman to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction and for um, sort of stealing some of my talk. But <laughs> inadvertent, but what are you going to do? There's some lines you just have to repeat, right? <laughs> And um, thank you all for coming to talk about the book. Uh, I especially want to thank Heidi Lopez for organizing the event so well, Catherine, of course, for moderating today. And I know that uh, many of you have the book, some of you have read some chapters from it, but I am not assuming that you have all gotten through any of the assigned reading or the recommended reading. So um, I'm going to use my time to give you an overview of the project and then to, to select from some of the material that I did highlight in those chapters, but also some from other chapters that um, I had not mentioned. And 
Uh, again, some of you will be familiar, some of this will be new. And to echo some things that you said, Catherine, I have to acknowledge that we are living in a moment of particularly intense scrutiny about the meaning of sexual violence, both legally and culturally. And indeed, as I was writing this book, over the last 10 years, uh, it just seemed as if the daily news was replete with stories about redefining rape. Uh, and there were the child abuse scandals. There were uh, other kinds of rape scandals, um, Strauss-Kahn. There's the uh, revisions of policy that I'll mention later. And in the last chapter of the book, which was going to be an epilogue, but then wound up being a whole chapter, I bring the story up to date. So it does stretch. There's the introductory and last chapter, really not a much original research, a synthesis of other work. But um, really what the book is trying to say is this isn't new. The effort to redefine rape has a long history. And I want to go back and talk about it because that history is relevant for what we're doing today. And we need to learn it to not repeat some of the mistakes, but also to understand how we've gotten to this construction. And you know, again, to repeat something that you said in the introduction, a lot of the history that I write about has been driven by women's rights and racial justice advocates who challenged the then dominant definition of rape in American history. And I'm saying really in the early America, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. Um, which was that rape was understood as a brutal attack on a chaste white woman by a strange man, typically considered to be an African-American man. In narrating efforts to change that definition, to expand it, to take it apart, I'm going to, I, I feel like I highlight three themes throughout the book, which I'll talk about at the outset. First, the historically fluid definition of rape. Second, its relationship to citizenship. And third, the historical context in which legal changes occur, as well as the limitations of those changes. And then I'll give some specific examples. So first point, the fluidity of the definition of rape may seem obvious, certainly to the historians here, but I think to most of us, I think it's still worth reiterating that rape is a highly malleable category in law and culture. Different societies determine which non-consensual acts will be condoned, which will be condemned, and of the latter, which will actually be forcefully, forcefully prosecuted. Those definitions have changed over the course of American history. But even as they change, the legacy of the earlier definitions, I think, can follow us along. For the record, the Anglo-American legal definition of rape in the 19th century was the carnal knowledge of a woman when achieved by force and against her will by a man other than her husband. For a child under the age of 10, the law did not require force or, in principle, raise the issue of consent. But over the age of 10, both violent physical force and proof of resistance were critical in proving rape in court, as was the prior chastity of the accuser. In the American context, rape law exempted not only marital, but also master-slave relations. And even after emancipation, the presumption that black women could not be raped long persisted. Now, corollary to the fluidity of rape is the influence of structures of privilege in revising the definition and prosecution of the crime. Who lived in fear of being raped and who lived in fear of being accused of being a rapist has depended heavily on social hierarchies, particularly of race and gender, but also of age and ethnicity. For example, from the late 18th through the 19th centuries, the dominant cultural understanding of which men posed the greatest threat of rape changed from Indians to white tramps and desperados to southern black men, a process of the racialization of rape. And although the legal definition throughout this period remained narrowly heterosexual, by the early 20th century, you find that some new immigrant men and then the figure of the homosexual male, as it emerges, comes to be seen as a threat to boys. Each of these constructions, you may have noticed, deflected attention away from sexual crimes committed by elite heterosexual white men. Okay, so that's the fluidity and structures of um, privilege. 
Second and related theme is that the changing definition and prosecution of rape in American history has been critical to the construction of citizenship. <coughs> And I mean by that who was to be included in and who was excluded from the, uh, the obligations and the rights of including voting, the ability to hold office, uh, jury service, as well as simply access to due process of law. And I'll explain on both a practical and a rhetorical level how rape relates to citizenship. So practically, the exclusion of women, African Americans, certain immigrants from voting, lawmaking, courtrooms, whether as jurors or judges or lawyers or sometimes even as observers, all of those exclusions in the criminal justice system contributed to the immunities enjoyed by white men who were accused or prosecuted for having seduced, harassed, or assaulted women of any race. And this lack of rights made certain groups more vulnerable to rape or to rape accusations or convictions. And then on a rhetorical level, the constructions of black women as always consenting, white women as duplicitous, they lie about rape, and black men as constant sexual threats, all of those constructions justified the very limitations on citizenship that reinforced white men's sexual privileges, the practical ones I just mentioned. Because these groups, black women, white women, black men, were seen as lacking the, the morality and the self-control that was considered necessary for citizenship. In short, our understandings of sexual assault contribute to the boundaries placed on rights, reinforcing the economic inequalities that these boundaries have historically sustained. Okay, I want to also address a third theme, which is really the story of the book, and that is why do certain groups contest the meaning of sexual violence at certain times, and to what effect? So I identified a series of challenges to the dominant definitions of rape, particularly on the part of white women and African American women and men during what I call the era of suffrage and segregation, in the, particularly in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries. And in this period, each of these groups mobilized for inclusion as full citizens, whether the women's suffrage movement or in black resistance to Jim Crow disenfranchisement and in the anti-lynching movement. But these groups formed no unified alliance, um, speak to one of your questions, uh, they had racially parallel rather than cooperative campaigns really well into the mid 20th century. Uh, these groups each uh, employed a range of strategies that are available to disenfranchised interest groups. They relied on the media, petitions to legislators, legal advocacy, as well as seeking more powerful allies in positions of power all to contest the dominant meanings of sexual violence. Now, at times, some of them succeeded in changing laws or cultural attitudes, uh, but almost always with mixed results. And I, I want to illustrate this with two specific examples from the book, one concerning racial justice, which draws on some of the chapters I uh, highlighted, and the other concerning child saving. Now, in choosing those two examples, I am ignoring this huge swath of the book that deals with women's rights and suffrage movements in which white women tried to redefine rape to include nonviolent coercive relationships with acquaintances, targeting white male assailants, and in most states um, successfully petitioning legislatures to criminalize seduction and to raise the age of consent above 10 to between um, 12 and 18 by, by the 1920s. But rarely did these white activists address the racial construction of rape that dominated popular and political discourse during this period. Black women and men faced far greater challenges in undermining the racial construction of sexual violence because that's how deeply the racialization of rape had taken place by the turn of the 20th century. Um, the views that black women had no moral virtue to defend that black men posed a constant threat to white women's purity, justified the exclusion of African Americans from full citizenship after emancipation. Now I'm well aware, <clears throat> as I should note, that this idea of the rapist as an aggressive black man does not originate in the late 19th century. 
Uh, it's much earlier in the colonial period. I mentioned in the book, um, and I think uh, you may have read this part, in, in 1765, an index to the laws of the Maryland colony read, rape, see Negroes. Though not yet considered a threat to all white women, African American men were already more likely to be convicted and executed when accused of rape than were white men. And then in the 19th century, the notion of, quote, the Negro crime, rape as the Negro crime, typically perpetrated against white women, persisted, reinforced by white press accounts and political rhetoric, especially after the end of Reconstruction. As you probably know, lynching rested in large part on the escalating myth that free black men threatened white women's safety and honor, and this fear intensified after slavery no longer ensured white dominance. Again, as many of you know, between the 1880s and the 1930s, lynching claimed thousands of black lives. And I think W.E.B. Du Bois really captured the centrality of sexual assault to the reestablishment of white supremacy in the South when he later wrote, and I quote, the charge of rape against colored Americans was invented by the white South after Reconstruction to excuse mob violence and then became the recognized method of re-enslaving blacks." End of quote. So even though we know that most lynchings had nothing to do with sexual assault, invoking the specter of interracial rape essentially protected the mob from criticism while simultaneously portraying black men as incapable of the rationality and moral control required for citizenship. By the 20th century, you really have examples of, um, uh, this is particularly during the uh, congressional debates about anti-lynching legislation, that to be anti-lynching is to be pro-rape. That's the construction. Well, I spent a good deal of time in the book discussing efforts to defend black men from false rape accusations. Some of you may have read some of those passages, but right now I want to actually focus on the less familiar parallel arguments that I made about uh, racial justice advocates arguing that black women deserve justice when assaulted by white men. Because I, I argue that identifying white men as rapists became a key strategy of the anti-lynching movement that gathered momentum during the early decades of the Great Migration. Naming black women as victims of interracial rape served a dual purpose of undermining the justification for lynching and demanding justice for those black men who assaulted, I mean, excuse me, white men who assaulted black women. And I think both of those efforts advanced the African-American quest for political rights. But redefining rape to include black women as victims was really a daunting task at the beginning of the 20th century. In the decade before she became the leading African-American critic of lynching, journalist Ida B. Wells explained, and I quote, among the many things that have transpired to dishearten the Negroes in their effort to attain a level in the status of civilized races has been the wholesale, contemptuous defamation of their women. And Wells famously insisted, and again I quote her, virtue knows no color line. The northern black women's clubs that she inspired rejected the dominant white cultural belief that African American women willingly engaged in promiscuous sexual relations and thus could not be raped. In the 1890s, um, these club women initiated a quest for sexual respectability among middle class black women. Uh, and they called for a single standard of justice. To give an example, uh, Florida Ruff and Ridley writing in the movement journal, The Woman's Era. We read with horror of two different colored girls who have recently been horribly assaulted by white men in the South. We should regret any lynchings of the offenders by black men, but we shall not have occasion. Should these offenders receive any punishment at all, it will be a marvel. Along with these black women's club members, the black press took a leading role in exposing the double standard of justice in rape <laughs> cases. And this is a time when the majority of newspaper accounts of rape in the white press, and I counted, the majority of them named black men as rapists. At this time, the black press began to point out this disparity, publicizing the underreporting of white on black rape. The Baltimore Afro-American, for example, noted in boldface that not a single daily paper has mentioned the rape of a 12-year-old colored girl by a white man, while 
every daily paper in the city carried black headlined news about the rape of a 16-year-old white girl by a colored man. The African-American press self-consciously uh, attempted to compensate. As I say, uh, one of my favorite headlines was in the Chicago Defender, 1911, white gentleman commits rape. And then the subhead is, that's all right, it was on a colored girl permitted by the United States government and the Confederacy. So the reports in the black press of white men who assault black women, and they, their northern and southern men are pointed out, regularly invert the racial tropes that pervaded the white press. The white press has Negro rapist all over the place, followed by um, uh, stories uh, from very short lynching stories to very elaborate ones. So the black press has the phrase white man followed by verbs such as charged, rapes, held, attempts, assaults. And I really like the lead to one report that I think epitomized the message that, quote, the ability to rape and the desire to commit such an act is not copyrighted by any particular race. Uh, the African-American press also monitored court proceedings, the police foreshadowing some of the legal changes that would come in the 1930s and afterwards as part of the civil rights movement. They complained about unequal application of capital punishment. They pointed out cases in contrast in sentencing of black and white men. The black press celebrated anything that troubled the association of black men as rapists. It wasn't our race this time in the beastly role the Chicago Defender posted in 1922 in a story about two white men who were jailed for the rape of a young 12-year-old Negro girl in North Carolina. After World War I, the black press also targeted white men known as mashers, who approached, insulted, and tried to pick up women on northern streets in the cities. For over a decade, suffragists had been complaining about these white male, what we would call street harassers. Um, but just after World War I, the white press kind of lost interest. And at that time, the black press began to elaborate on the racial dynamics of street harassment as part of this larger effort to redefine sexual assault to be, include black women <laughs> as victims and to cite white men as perpetrators. Now, we know that black women in the South had long endured insults from white men as they went to work, on the streets. They had little recourse for complaining. But I think that the northern migration and the mounting political consciousness of the new Negro raised expectations that African American women ought to be able to move more safely on integrated public streets. So in the 1920s and 30s, the black papers target white men who sexually insult or approach African American women. Uh, again, the uh, Baltimore Afro-American really takes this on. And the writers in that paper often apply this derogatory slang term referring to these men as ofe mashers. I don't know if that word means anything to anyone, but my best translation would be white trash mashers with a little more zing to it than that. So masher accounts in the black press um, blamed white men and also often praised black women for their resilience, such as uh, the plucky Miss Boyer, who fought off a white masher when he tried to embrace her in the hotel elevator car that she operated. And she had the wherewithal as, as he's trying to assault her. Remember the little, you don't remember, those levers. <laughs> anyway, she sort of surreptitiously brings the elevator down to the lobby while he's trying to assault her and then opens the door so this crowd of people sees him. And he's actually arrested um, because of her, her resilience. Whenever um, police arrested or courts convicted white men who harassed black women, the African-American press celebrated. Well, both the rhetoric in the press and the reports of um, court victories suggest that by the 1930s, a small wedge had appeared in the racialization of rape, allowing some black women to become believable victims and some white men to be punished for interracial rape, attempted rape, or harassment. And as I've said, naming these white assailants served the larger goals of the anti-lynching movement, simultaneously empowering African-American women's quest for respectability and sexual safety. I would say there are some limits, and this gets to another one of your questions, in that I noticed in the press, the more attention to white assailants of black women, in some ways, the less attention to intraracial black rape, which had been a focus as well in the black press. OK, there's one other uh, example I want to share with you, um, which is the identification of certain men as sexual threats to boys in the 20th century, which is 
less well known than the racialization of rape, but similarly, I, I think, contributed to contracting possibilities for citizenship. Concerns about the sexual vulnerability of boys. Uh, these emerged within the complex context of progressive air reform in the early 20th century. And this is, uh, there's a range of, quote, reforms from child-saving impulses to immigration restriction. Uh, and it's also the period of the emergence of what I've called sexual liberalism as a kind of loosening of the purely reproductive nature of sexuality. Uh, by recognizing boys as objects of sexual seduction or victims of assault, doctors, jurists, social scientists at this time contested the longstanding Anglo-American definition of rape as only heterosexual, as only a heterosexual crime. And it's sort of a foreshadowing of what will become gender-neutral rape laws. You get the first calls for those. At the same time, though, sexually vulnerable children began to supplant adult women in the discourse of sexual assault, while immigrants and homosexual men became increasingly associated with child predation. While African American men were overrepresented in rape prosecutions, they were rarely charged with sodomy, perhaps because of cultural associations of black men with hypermasculinity rather than with effeminacy. Rather, certain foreign born men became associated with perversion, reflecting in part the native sentiments that contributed to the enactment of immigration restriction on, in the 1920s. And then after the 1930s, during a series of panics over um, child sex murders, the newly emerging figure of the male homosexual began to replace the immigrant sodomite as the primary sexual peril for boys. Sodomy law was critical to this process, and again, since rape law covered only heterosexual relations. Sodomy law had seldom been used to punish consensual relations in the 19th century in America. But sodomy statutes did allow the prosecution of non-consensual sexual acts, particularly if they used force. And often, the charges included relationships between a man and a youth or a boy. So sodomy law served as a kind of unofficial age of consent mechanism for male-male relations. And at the turn of the 20th century, in the context of concerns about urban vice, the vulnerability of children, immigration, uh, arrests for sodomy, particularly involving cases involving minors, increased in American cities all over the country. And at first, the expanding discourse on sexual relations between men and boys often targeted recent immigrants. We know that the demonization of foreigners as sexually immoral had originally focused on women as potential prostitutes, particularly Chinese, Jewish women, or on Jewish and Chinese men as pimps and traffickers. But concerns about immigrant immorality included same-sex relations as well. So for example, on the West Coast, uh, nativists warned that the Chinese would bring paganism, incest, and sodomy, as well as miscegenation to America. In 1909, a California physician who treated several teenage boys for rectal gonorrhea blamed their condition on what he called sodomistic practices and claimed that, though these were once rare, again I quote, since the influx of foreigners from those countries where unnatural practices are common, more cases are, more now, are now seen attributing to immigrants a penchant for sexual perversion, I think drew upon the ideas of the early sexologists, such as Richard von Croft Ebbing, whose theory of racial degeneracy associated perversion with primitive classes, um, primitive races, and poor immigrants. In the 19th century, American newspapers had rarely reported on sodomy cases. But during the progressive era, the press began occasionally exposing queer subcultures in covering episodes such as a 1912 Portland, Oregon sex scandal. <laughs> this is a crackdown in which um, dozens of predominantly white middle class men were arrested for sodomy, some of them socializing at private drag parties. Even though the youngest was age 19, the press and the court highlighted the danger <coughs> posed to youths. Some Oregon politicians called for harsh punishment, including the sterilization of perverts. And one Portland resident suggested that authorities were being too lenient with the arrested men. This is in a letter to the editor of a local paper. The writer stated that, quote, 
if these degenerating practices were committed by Greeks or Hindus, there would have been calls to drown them in the Willamette River. Well, in fact, Greeks and Hindus were more likely to be seen as perverse male predators. Greek immigrants represented less than 1% of the population of Portland in the beginning of the 20th century, but they appeared in over 11% of the arrests in the 1912 sex scandal. Authorities became particularly alarmed about, quote, immoral boys who pander to the passions of vicious Greeks. Uh, and this association could go back to Mediterranean cultures that allowed some physical and even some sexual contact among men or because of the skewed sex ratios among certain immigrant groups where there may have been more same-sex relations uh, tolerated. Uh, male immigrants from Greece, Italy like those from China and South Asia may have had a reputation for same-sex relations. But whatever the source, the insinuation of perversity could have serious implications, including eligibility for entry into the U.S. and ultimately the possibility of citizenship. In the early 20th century, sexual perversion itself was not an explicit ground for excluding immigrants, but officials found other ways to deny entry if they suspected people. So for example, a doctor um, examining a young Greek man in 1912 warned against admitting those with deformed genitals because they, quote, may be sexual perverts. The 1911 U.S. Immigration Commission report on the traffic in women called for stronger restrictions, quote, applied with even greater rigidity in the case of men. And immigration restriction, uh, excuse me, immigration officials lamented the fact that so-called moral perverts were not specifically excluded by the law. You know, I wonder if the restrictive immigration uh, legislation that took effect in the 20s could have diffused some of these concerns. But beginning in the 30s, a full-blown moral panic over the threat posed to children by adult men led to a spate of new laws, specialized institutions to treat their so-called uncontrolled desires. And the ethnic child predator gave way to the sexual psychopath portrayed as a white man who needed psychiatric attention rather than prison. By the post-World War II era, when gay male urban cultures became more vibrant and more visible, the image of psychopathic homosexuals who threatened young boys helped to fuel anti-gay hysteria and sent some of these men to psychiatric prisons with indeterminate sentences. And I think this reconfiguration suggests how heavily the redrawing of boundaries in the name of protecting children depended on changing perceptions of larger social threats like the demonization of African-American men as violent rapists. The associations of certain immigrants and then of homosexual males with child abuse clearly masked other forms of assault committed by native-born white men, including heterosexual rape and incest. And this history, I think, helps explain why, by the end of the 20th century, for example, in the 1970s, in response to Anita Bryant's Save the Children campaign, rejecting the association with child predators would become so important to the gay rights movement. <clears throat> In surveying a few examples of racial justice and child-saving influences on past redefinitions of rape, I hope that I have conveyed the fluidity of the concept of rape, its relationship to citizenship, and the complex legacies of any effort at reform, particularly legal change. In our own time, the term rape has been expanded to include non-forcible as well as violent acts committed by and upon members of any gender or race, regardless of marital status, regardless of penetration. This is very recent. The FBI only in 2012 revised the definition of rape for the Uniform Crime Reports that they had instituted in 1927. This is like less than two years old that this change has been made. Men who, in addition, men who once enjoyed immunity from prosecution by virtue of their social status, such as clergy, teachers, coaches, now at least face closer scrutiny about their uh, abuse of girls and boys and young men and women. Despite this new attention, I think it's clear that earlier constructs remain deeply embedded in our culture and that the benefits of redefinitions of rape have been unequally distributed. <coughs> I think of the underreporting of rape, 
the racial profiling of perpetrators, the silencing of sexually abused children, and the victim blaming that contributes assaults to women's clothing or their past sexual histories, uh, all of these persist. My research suggests strongly that contestations over the meaning of sexual violence are going to continue as long as social inequalities, and particularly those based on race and gender, characterize American life. Thank you very much.